Morning, 1111. Thrilled to be here. Not just that I get to be with you, but this is one of my favorite days of the year. In part because several decades ago, a woman named Marilyn Eli gave birth to the love of my life. It's my wife's birthday, and I would hate to be married to a writer and a speaker, and my wife has put up with it for at least, well, 27 of the 29 years she's been alive, right? So, love you, honey. Thank you for uh, putting up with me. Let's pray. Father, you, your son tells us that he'll be lifted up. He'll draw all men to himself. That's our prayer today. And through this word, you would lift yourself up that we could find the delight of our hearts met in you. That can happen by your spirit. We pray that it would in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the July 4th weekend, our neighbors asked us to watch their dogs. They have two. A fat little lovable beagle named Maggie, sweet as they come as far as dogs go, and then a white chihuahua they call Lucy. I think Lucy's short for Lucifer. <laughs> we have a picture of these two dogs here. The first time Lucy met my wife, she bit her. If you want to be my friend, generally speaking, biting my wife isn't the way to get there. It's not just my wife and I that have an issue with Lucy, who I like to refer to as the albino white demon dog. Uh, I found others as well. In fact, I saw Brian Long here on campus. He heard that I'd been watching Lucy. He said, that white chihuahua? I said, yeah. He goes, I hate that dog. <laughs> now, Brian and I were just your average, everyday, ordinary Christians, but I know an incredible man of faith, senior pastor of one of the country's largest churches, past president of the Southern Baptist Convention, married to a saint, three sons, all involved in Christian ministry as solid as they come. This giant of the faith who has proven himself through decades has said of this dog, and I quote, every time I see that mud, I want to drop kick it through the goalposts. <laughs> I think if the Apostle John was alive today and he was writing the Gospel of John, instead of John 3.16 saying, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, I think John would be tempted to pause. For God so loved the world, except for Lucy, the white albino demon dog. It's really kind of that situation. And so our, our task was supposed to be pretty simple. We're supposed to make sure they're fed and then let them get out every day to do their business. But the first day I went in and opened up the kennel, although Maggie just kind of waddled out, Lucy shot out like a bullet, and I'm trying to chase after her, but if I'd get her close to a corner, she'd get scared, and she would have a physical manifestation that I would have to then clean up later. So I, I, I'm just trying to scoot her toward the door. I thought I could get my wife and daughters to help me, but when I talked to Lisa about it, she said, well, then I got to put on my jeans. And the girl said, why do you have to put on your jeans? And said, well, because she bit me, so didn't make the girls too excited. But they still stood up to it, and we tried. But we just weren't able to get Lucy outside. I still fed her. I still made sure she had water. I took care of her as best I could. And, and here's how Lucy thanked me. Because I couldn't ever get her outside, every morning she left me a little present. <laughs> a little pile right next to the kitty litter box. I would walk into the house, I would smell it first thing, and I'm like, oh, grab a paper towel. But then there was Maggie, as sweet as dog as they come. She would hear the garage door opening up, and so she'd be waiting for me at the door. And I would open up, and she's right there wagging her tail. She can't really wag her tail without wagging half of her body. So she's waking half of her body greedy, and she would follow me all around. I'm, I'm feeding, you know, the cat, make sure they have it there, and Maggie had to test that, make sure it was okay for the cats, and then, no, Maggie, you're over here, and then I'd feed up her food and her water, and I'd take her out, and she really didn't want to go out unless I was right next to her, so I had to stay outside and sit outside with her, so she was there long enough to do her business, and after a couple days, she just wouldn't, fall, she wouldn't let me go at all, I mean, she's like doing a perfect heel, and I looked down at her, I could tell she's just lonely, she was missing her family, I said, Maggie, 
do you want to come to my house? And she's waggling her tail. So I pick her up. I take her into my house. And she, she was a little scared there because she'd never been there. But then we went out in the front yard and just hung out a little bit. And it was fun getting to spend that weekend with Maggie. I, I still fed Lucy. I still made sure she was watered. I tried to care for her. But that's about all that happened. I want to ask you this morning, when it comes to your relationship with God, are you a Maggie or a Lucy? How do you react toward God? When God wants to love you, when God wants to care for you, do you let him do the bare minimum? He can save you. He can provide for your basic needs. But if he shows your face, you're, or are you just, are you resisting God loving you? Are you letting God love you? Now, God's love is absolute. We, in one sense, don't have to let God love us. He chooses to love us of his own will. But I'm not talking about that kind of love. I'm talking about experiencing God's love. Are you letting God love you in such a way that his love builds you up when you're discouraged? Are you letting God love you in such a way that when you feel alienated and cast out from everyone you know, God is right there, your truest friend? When you're just feeling down or doubtful that God is there giving you his security, does God's love build you up and carry you and feed you and minister to you? Or is God's love just some doctrine you read about in Sunday school and occasionally see in your Bible, but it doesn't really feed your life? We're in a series, we're in a whole year, actually, 2011, where we're talking about the year of worship. And this month is a series that Ben started last week about how we can develop regular times of personal worship and devotion. And the challenge we have is that we often look at those daily quiet times as an obligation, a chore, something we check off our list, say, okay, I got that done, otherwise we feel guilty. I want you this morning to look at your quiet times, maybe like you never have before. Instead of looking at it as a spiritual duty, what if you were to look at your quiet times as opportunities to let God love you? What if you looked at it so that when you wake up, you say, you know what, I've got all this going on in my life. I need to let God love me today. Would that change the way you look at your quiet times? I know somebody said, Gary, come on. This just sounds like weird spirituality. Sounds like something I'd hear on Oprah. I, I'm not talking about Oprah. I'm not talking about weird spirituality. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about scripture. 1 John 4.19, written by John, who is called in scripture, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John says this, we love because he first loved us. How cool to be known as a disciple, beloved of Jesus. John lived in that love. And what he tells us today, the only way we can love, the only way we can love God is because he first loved us. The only way we can love others is because we receive God's love. The only way we can love ourselves is if we first receive God's love. We cannot love unless we're first loved. That's the way God made us. If we don't let God love us, if we don't experience that love, we won't be able to love. And that's a challenge in some of your lives. Some of your lives, are, the reason you're making everybody around you miserable, maybe even the reason you're destroying your own life, is you're not letting God love you. Some of you single gals, you're wondering, why do I fall for the wrong guy again and again and again? Why don't I just put a sign on my head, say, losers only need apply, because those are the only guys I choose. If you're in that pattern, you know what that tells me? You're not letting God love you. Because when you don't let God love you, what you desire becomes skewed. When you don't let God love you, you can become deceived. You can be drawn to things that are destructive to you instead of life-giving and spiritually helpful. A good friend of mine is a marriage and family therapist, just a very skilled counselor. And he told me, Gary... If a guy isn't actively worshiping God, he's addicted to something. He's addicted to something. I don't know what it is. It might be money. It might be alcohol. It might be lust. It might be people pleasing. But if he's not receiving God's love, I know something is going to get him. There are two realities in regards to personal devotion. 
The first reality is that ministry, in a positive sense, flows out of friendship with God. But sin flows out of alienation from God. That's why it's so crucial to spend time every day to let God love us. Because in a positive sense, that's what feeds ministry. That's the best ministry that flows out of a deepening friendship with God. But in the same way, sin is what flows out of alienation from God. And that's what my counselor friend was referring to. When we stop worshiping, we start sinning. It's, it's one of those spiritual rules that's just going to happen. Another way to put this is if you're not walking in your worship pathway, you're falling into sin. You can find out what your worship pathway is and walk in it intentionally. I'm not talking about just knowing that God saved you, coming to church once a week, maybe even going to Bible study or a small group afterwards. But if you're not actively, intentionally, I believe daily worshiping God, in some ways, you're falling into sin. So you might be saying, are, are you implying I can worship my way out of sin? Is that what you're implying? No, I'm stating it outright. I'm saying that's the best way to deal with sin, not to focus on not sinning, but to be so caught up by the glory of God to let our hearts be filled by his beauty, our minds to be filled by his truth, something we have to do every day because we're deceived every day, we're tempted every day, the world is lying to us every day, and when we put ourselves before the Lord and say, God, I'm in such a desperately needy situation, will you love me today? He loves us so well. We become ruined to this world. But you can't become ruined to this world unless you become friends with God. And it's something that needs to be ongoing in our lives. It's like this. If I scrimp on personal worship and devotion, it doesn't matter how long I've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how much I've studied scripture. It doesn't matter how much God has used me in the past. If I get lazy in personal worship on a daily basis... It's only a matter of time until I indulge in sin. If you scrimp on personal worship and devotion, it's only a matter of time until you indulge in sin. That's what's going on. Last week, Ben talked about the barriers that keep us from letting God love us. Remember that stupid, stubborn carnal that keep hitting the, hitting the window. And one of those barriers that Ben talked about, and he used the illustration of the toboggan hat. Is that, that what you called it? Toboggan hat, where he had different people put it on, is this one-size-fits-all spirituality. Because it's easy to teach and easy to hold people accountable to, we've developed a certain form of quiet time that we think everybody has to practice. But the problem is it doesn't fit us any more than one-size-fits-all clothing doesn't fit us. And so he talked about how we need to begin to express and understand how God created us in different ways. And we're going to be introducing this morning our nine sacred pathways, nine different windows that Christians have found to let God love them. You might have a blend of these. You might have a couple of these. The importance isn't to put yourself in a new box, but just to become familiar with, if I need to be loved by God on a daily basis, how can I create a life experience on a regular basis to let God's love through? I want to run through these very quickly and then we'll look at a few more. You've got them in your bulletin if you want to pull that out. It's listed here because we don't have time to get into all of them. I'm just going to mention a few. But we see some that are listed there including the naturalists. These are Christians whose hearts are opened up to God when they get out of doors. The worst thing for a naturalist to do is the stereotypical quiet time of going into a room, closing your eyes and bowing your head. Their hearts are opened up toward God when they get out of doors. It, it draws them in. We'll talk more about them later. Then there are the sensates who approach God mainly through the five senses. Their worship surroundings really matter. A place like this with great windows and good music and all that, that really draws them in. There are the traditionalists who love God through ritual and symbol. They often like to do things like follow the Christian calendar or have regular rituals in their life. They're going to set up Bible study at a certain time. They might even read prepared prayers, something like that. But the fact that they are in the flow of worship that the church has been expressing toward God through the centuries has great meaning and opens up their heart to God. Ascetics is a very awkward title. Just think monks and nuns. These are Christians that like to get away. They need solitude. They need simplicity. The out-of-doors majestic surroundings are actually 
distractions to these Christians. They live in an interior world, and so they want to shut it all out as they approach the Lord. There are activists drawn to God in the midst of confrontation and accomplishment. To them, church is just sort of a pit stop where you get your batteries recharged, you get the volunteers together, and you go out where worship really happens. Caregivers love God by loving others. Enthusiasts are those Christians that, that love to celebrate. They love to live in the mystery of serving a supernatural God. Contemplatives. Contemplatives are the Christians that moo. Have you ever known that they're really deep people and they really resonate and they really think things through and so you share something and they're like, mmm, mmm. Mm. Those are sort of the contemplative types. They're, they're the deep type. And if we'll leave them alone for their mooing, they can really come out with some amazing things that can challenge us in our own faith. And then they're the intellectuals. Their hearts are opened largely through new understanding. Now, that's just going over there. I want to give you three, and then we're going to kind of wrap it up about how we let God love us. But, but three that will be sort of representative examples of how you can begin to set up times with the Lord. If it's so desperate that we learn to let him love us, how you can be more intentional about setting up those personal times to let God's love through. Let's talk about the naturalists first, those who like to get out of doors. There is such a testimony in scripture to how God can use nature to reveal himself to us. Psalms 19.1 might be the most famous. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. In the New Testament, Paul writes in Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made. In other words, what, what, what God made reveals that he is. You know, Scripture doesn't just say that, that what God made revealed, reveals what he is. It also says that God can use the out of doors to restore us, to renew us, to build us up. That's what's happening in Psalms 23, 1 through 3, when the psalmist writes this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down. In green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Now clearly God's the one doing the restoration here. But what the psalmist is saying is he's using nature to do it. Being outside, being surrounded by what he's made. Does wonderful things for my heart to, to build me up. An analogy that might help you understand this. When our oldest daughter went away to college the first year. Her bedroom became like this black hole in our house. Her, her absence became a presence. And the problem is her bedroom is right outside our master bedroom. So I would pass this empty bedroom several times a day, reminding me that Allison no longer lives with us. And after I had dealt with that a couple weeks and I would miss Allison, I wouldn't get my alley time and I wanted to think about her, feel close to her, the best place for me to go was into that bedroom. And I could flip on the light. And though Allison wasn't present in the bedroom, the way she had set it up, the things that she liked best, the way she organized everything, spoke to me of Allison's presence. I could pray for her there. I felt closer to the, her there. It was like sort of I was with her. And, and that's what it's like for a naturalist. They go out of doors and we're not pantheists. We don't think God is in nature. But the way that God created nature, the way he set it up, reveals to us who he is. We can look at the large things like the mountains if you travel out of Houston. Or, or we could go to Galveston and, and just be overwhelmed if you just try to count the grains of sand and you see the God's breath or beauty. I, I, I've talked to hikers who are going way up and, and they're in this place where they don't think any human will ever be and God has created these incredible flowers. It speaks a lot to them of God's character that he creates something so beautiful that no human will ever see. That says a lot about God to a naturalist. In fact, when you think about it, when a man and woman walked with God more closely and more intimately than any other humans ever have, it wasn't in a giant cathedral. Where was it? It was the Garden of Eden. And so there are some believers, even though this might sound weird to some of us, they might actually get more sometimes watching a colony of ants crawl across the log than they would from a sermon. Not this sermon, of course, but your everyday average sermon, they're going to pick out more. And so if that's you, you just need to get outside. You need to recognize, you know what? If I 
close my eyes and bow my head, I'm toast. I, I need to watch the sunrise. I need to see the sunset. I maybe need to get out at lunch. Maybe I'm going to go out of my way home to take a walk because that's really the best way for me to worship. And if I'm really needing God's touch, that's where I need to go. Another pathway I want to look at are the intellectuals. The intellectuals. In, in some sense, I think this is an unfortunate title because you think they have to be smart. It doesn't have anything to do with your intelligence. I'm an intellectual, all right? How smart do you have to be? A, a better title might be conceptual. In that meaning, you, you need new understanding, new concepts. Energize your mind and that opens up your heart to appreciate God in new ways. Romans 12 too talks about them. It says that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And the intellectual's quiet time will often center around their mind. Their, their casual devotions might be with four or five other books. They've got their commentaries and their Bible dictionaries and a couple different versions of the Bible. And, and sometimes they'll come to church services and there'll be these, you know, warm, emotionally laden testimonies flowery romantic worship songs and they're sitting in the back saying you know all this touchy-feely kumbaya stuff is fine but can you give me some data can, can you just give me something to sink my teeth into because their hearts don't really get engaged until their mind is opened up here's a an example that might help explain that I was speaking in New England a, a number of years ago at that time I was living and working in the Washington DC area after I got done smoking, they had a big lunch, and we were sitting around a large table. I mean, there are a number of these tables, but the one I was around had about 12 people around it. There's a middle-aged guy sitting right next to me. We were just talking and chatting. He had a name tag that said Gordon, and there's just something about him that seemed really familiar, and I, I, I didn't know why. I'm, I'm trying to place it. And finally, about two-thirds of the way through lunch, it dawned on me, and I looked at him. I said, are you Gordon Humphrey, the retired United States senator from New Hampshire? He says, I am, but don't tell anybody. I'm enjoying just being a regular guy. Well, everybody around heard that conversation, and suddenly we stopped. And we'd just been chatting, just throwing out, and suddenly we didn't realize we had a celebrity at the table. I and mean, this was former United States senator. We started speaking to him differently. We started treating him differently. Whether we should have or not is a fair question, but the fact is we did. And that's what it's like for an intellectual that when they understand new things about God, for them, doctrines and dogma, they're not dead like they seem to some of you. When we think of God's glory, when we think of things like providence or the Trinity or we understand God's omniscience, those doctrines, they get us energized. We have new respect for God. That's who you are. That's so cool. And it launches our hearts into an act of worship because that's the way God made us. And so if you're an intellectual, you're buying more books probably than CDs. You, you, one sermon a week might not do it for you. Over Easter, I kind of have this bent. Over Easter, not only did I preach twice, that week I listened to five Easter sermons. A few of the other ones here, and then I got on the internet and listened to a couple as well. I know some of you, you're, you're boggled at that. I mean, the sermon is the price you pay to get great worship and to meet with friends afterwards. You can't even imagine listening to five in a week. But that's because we're made differently. It might surprise some of you, but some of us come to church for different reasons. Uh, like all arenas of life, my daughter went to an Astros game last night, and she told me that one of her friends said, you know, I'm not really that interested in baseball, but I'm seriously interested in baseball players. <laughs> And some of you come to church, you're not really that interested in the singing. You're not really that interested in the sermon, but you really like getting together with people afterwards. God has made us differently. We come together with a shared worship experience. And then finally, before we tie this together, I want to look at the caregivers, those who love God largely by loving others. A good verse for them would be James 1.27 when James writes that pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God, our Father, is this. Look after the orphans and widows in their distress. It's an interesting verse that James is saying if you want a religion, in other words, a worship that really pleases God, Find a group that's alienated. Find a group that's down and out. Meet their needs in my name. And my presence is going to be 
You're gonna feel closer to me than perhaps any other moment in your life. That's a religion that's acceptable to me. I know a woman who was very much a caregiver. She liked to take in the hard cases, the, the foster kids that nobody else would take care of. And she's given one severely brain damaged boy that she named Manuel. He was born with just a tiny little bit of a brain stem. He was a product of incest and then his mom had taken drugs. So he'd been just so damaged that he's the kind of kid that frankly, some doctors thought, you just let this one die. But she thought, no, God has called me to care for this boy. So she took him into her home. I met Manuel when he was over two years old. She still had to carry him in an infant carrier because he would never walk, he would never talk. And yet she cared for that boy. She loved that boy. And one night, just before she's about to put him to sleep, she was saying her final prayers, and Manuel went into seizures and contortions. And I don't know if you've ever seen a little boy do that, but it's a, it's a horrific sight. It's like something just taken over, and all of a sudden his hands are going up, his head's going like that, his tongue's going wild, and then he just starts shaking, and it's freaking her out. She just grabs that boy, and she hugs him, and she's praying over him. And his body quiets down. A few minutes pass and it happens again. And he's going around like this. And then he's shaking. And she's just crying out to God. She doesn't know what's going on. She's not a nurse. She's just holding him. Lord, please heal him. And she'd speak God's peace over him. And then his body would quiet down. A few more minutes went by and it happened again. This cycle went on for seven Hours, seven hours, seizures, quiet, seizures, quiet. It was almost dawn when she finds herself crying out in prayer. She is emotionally, spiritually, physically spent. She's got nothing left. And she's crying out to God with this schizophrenic prayer. Lord, please don't let him die. I'm not ready to say goodbye to him yet, but I can't keep doing this. And she realized how th that prayer was at cross purposes. That she's saying, I can't keep loving this boy, but I don't want to see him go. And God responded by giving her such a powerful sense of his presence. The Gail told me the hair went up on the back of her neck. Her eyes were closed as she was praying. She couldn't pry him open because she was convinced that somehow if she did, she would see God physically manifest before her. She didn't know about the theology. She didn't know how that could work. But his presence was that strong. So she just waited for it to fade, and it didn't. And she's terrified. He's so strong. He's so there. He's there in a way she's never known before. Finally, she has to force her eyes open, fully expecting to see God right in front of her. She's actually surprised when she doesn't. So she's looking around the room. He's got, he's got to be here somewhere. Maybe he's coming through the roof. And then, then she looks in her lap at this severely brain damaged boy at the doctor's thought, let's just let this one die that she cared for in Jesus' name. And that's where God was making himself known to Gail. And that's what marks a caregiver. We're all called to look after the orphans and widows in their distress. We're all called to give care. But what marks it as a worship pathway is that's where God becomes so present to you. It's where you become fed spiritually. For a lot of us, that kind of activity would just drain the life out of us. For her, it's a life-giving force. She can't stop doing it because that really is her form of worship. She gets the same thing spiritually out of that that the intellectual gets with his books that the naturalist gets walking through the woods. And, and it doesn't have to be just caring for sick people. And a caregiver could be a guy who likes to volunteer on a rescue squad, likes to fix cars for single moms or widows, or even take care of a church building. And, and I'd like to challenge some of the wives here because I, I've seen, if, if I could say this gently, but I've seen some Christian wives be a little judgmental of their husbands because their husbands aren't particularly musically inclined. And so worship is going on and the wives might be enthusiasts and they're getting into it. God is so real. He's so present. They want it to go on for an hour. Forget the sermon. Just keep going, Brian. I mean, that, that's what they're thinking. And then they steal a glance at their husband and he's just kind of, you know, wait. And they think because he's not into singing that he's not into God. 
That's a wrong assumption. Though singing is a key part of worship, it goes back to the Old Testament. It'll always be an important part of worship. It is so much bigger than that scripturally, how we worship God, how we love God. I, I just want to open up your eyes by giving you an analogy. And this, I'm, I'm sorry, it shows my neurosis that my wife has to put up with every day. I'm sorry to have to give it to you every now and then. But one of the anxieties I fight back in my life having two daughters and a son, but thinking of my two daughters, is that I know statistically, someday they'll probably be widows. And I know the sensible ones of you saying, Gary, they're not even married yet, and you're anxious about them being widows. Sorry, I just, I try, I, I give it up to the Lord. But statistically, they're going to outlive their husbands, They're going to, and I'm not going to be there. And the thought that I might not be able to to take care of them or make sure they got their financial needs met or they're okay. It, it just really bothers me. And, and if I look 75 years in the future, and not that anybody would, but if somebody wanted to remember me, what, what would please me most? A group of people getting around a room, wasn't Gary a nice guy? Let, let's, let's write a song about Gary. Let's, let's think about Gary. Or people that would just take care of my daughters. People that would say they're, going to be, they're not going to be lonely. They're not going to be neglected. They're going to be fed. They're going to be taken care of. They're not going to be sick and on their own. They're going to have someone with them. Not even close. Take care of the girls. Sheds new light on James 1.27 when God says, you want a religion that's acceptable to me? Find the down and out. Find the alienated. Love them. Love me. By loving them. Now, this doesn't mean that caregivers just care for people and never read scripture. It doesn't mean that naturalists take walks in the woods, take their fishing pole with them, and never open the Bible. You're not a well-rounded Christian if you're not getting scripture into your life every day. But it affects how you read the Bible. If, if you're a naturalist, you probably don't read a Bible like this every day like I do. This is right next to my deck. You probably, this isn't the main Bible you read. If you're a naturalist, your Bible might look like this. You've got a little one that you're just walking around with. You might be reading it by walking through the woods, sitting by a stream. You're getting scripture in your life that way. If you're, if you're a caregiver, you might be often studying scripture with others, helping them along. It's not that you don't have a balanced life. It's the way that you get scripture into your life. And, and I know this is a challenge for those of you who consider yourselves intellectuals. And I, I'm speaking as one of you, okay? I, I, I want to say this gently but directly. Our temptation as intellectuals is that we think deep down in our guts that we have the only legitimate pathway. We do. We think it's, it, it's the only way. That, that, and not only that it's, it's about that, but it's a particular type of Bible study. Can, can I just give you a little historical perspective? Paul wrote Colossians 3.16 2,000 years ago. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It wasn't until the 15th century that the printing press was developed. For 75% of the church's history... Everyday Christians didn't have Bibles. It's rather a modern thing that we can all walk around with the Bible. And even then, even after the printing press was developed, it's not like people could afford them. In fact, in the 17th century, the great Puritan Richard Baxter wanted to take the Bible from academic language that nobody could understand, translated it and paraphrased it into a modern English at that time. And the church was so grateful, they put him in jail. And so when we think our Bible study is the only way to fulfill Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, what we're saying is that Paul said, well, you're not going to really be able to do this for 1,800 years. But hang on, in almost two millennia, then you'll be able to be honest. With there are other ways to get the word in our life. And rather than judge other pathways, what we have to do is learn from them. Because if you're an intellectual, I, my, my, my challenge is this. I, I've known men who studied this Bible inside and out. They were my religion professors at a secular university. They knew it inside and out. They studied it regularly. They didn't believe it. They didn't obey it. Does that honor God? And so if you're an intellectual, I'd say, it's great. 
I, I, I know, I get the same pop as you. The, just this morning, reading in 1 Samuel, I'm overwhelmed at a whole new thought and so grateful to God because he meets me so strongly in a particular form of Bible study. But if you're an intellectual, let me just ask this. How's your prayer life? Are, are you setting aside time to communicate with God? Are you letting him speak into your life? Are you presenting your quest before him? How's your life of adoration? Are, are there moments when you are moved to tears at God's brilliance and his goodness and his love and his mercy. I hope so. Because a mind filled with doctrine that doesn't have a heart filled with passion becomes a weapon instead of a servant. See, rather than putting the pathways against each other, they remind us what we all need because the contemplative says, all this study is great, but do you love God more today than you did yesterday? And the caregiver says, well, that Bible study and prayer thing is great, but are you caring for the unfortunate? And the enthusiast said, yeah, but let's celebrate God because he deserves to be celebrated. And the activist, yeah, but, but, but we have to serve God. We have to stand up against injustice. You know, they're all right. And rather than judge other pathways because I particularly relate to one. I want to have God love me through the one that meets me most or the ones that meet me most, but then also learn from those other pathways. And, and that's what sort of ties this together. If, if God is going to love you this week, how's he going to do it? Have you created a vehicle that lets God love you? And I want to remind you what I said earlier. God's love is absolute. It's based on his, your acceptance through the work of Jesus Christ. That love is absolute. But are you letting yourself experience God's love? Are you creating opportunities where God can build you up with his love? Or are you shutting the door, putting shutters over the windows, and then putting roadblocks to your house so he can't get to you? Is there a daily vehicle that God can love you? Now, I read an article this last week that said one of the demographics that have been hit hardest by this economy are middle-aged women. Do we have any middle-aged women here? All right, that's a bad way to ask it. Do we have any very young-looking, very youthful middle-aged women? The reality is if you're born after 64, you're either middle-aged or other. So I, I just... The reason they have it hit so hard is this is new thing going on in generation. 70% of baby boomers are still financially supporting adult children or grandchildren. And a lot of times because people live longer, not only are they caring for their children, they have parents or siblings that require care as well. In fact, the typical caregiver, I'm not talking about caregiver as a pathway here. I'm talking about caregiver as a government label for people who are providing hands-on care to someone else outside their home or their, their immediate family. The typical caregiver today is a woman in her late 40s who already has at least one child at home and works outside the home, right? That's a tired woman right there. But also gives on average 20 hours of hands-on care outside the home. That's an exhausting life. That's a tough life, and not, that's not her only obligation. She might have a husband who wants her to act like a wife now and then, and, and then she feels like she's got to exercise. Look, I, I understand, so when I come up here and say, you've got to have daily times with the Lord, you're saying, Gary, the last thing I need is one more thing on my to-do list. I need something taken off. I want you to look at it differently. You think you can provide that kind of heroic care without letting God love you? You think you can keep giving like that without being filled up with God's presence and spirit on a regular basis? If you have to give every day, you got to receive every day. That's the scriptural truth. It's true for all of us. Some of you are so beset by temptations, some of which have become addictions. Your temptations, your addictions don't take a day off. How can you take a day off from worship? How are you going to resist if you're not receiving from the Lord every day, even though you're being tempted every day? Some of you are in some really tough relationships. Maybe you're married to a non-believer, and it feels like it's sucking you dry. You give and you give and you give. You're getting nothing. Or your, your spouse is going crazy. It's so hard to respond with a Christ-like spirit. You're, you're facing such feelings of loneliness. You think you can live that life? 
without letting God love you? You think you can possibly survive that without receiving from God? Some of you live with physical pain every day. You can't remember the last time you felt well. You think you can have that challenge? You think you can have that life without getting bitter if you're not letting God love you? You think that one hour of worship a week on Sunday morning is going to sustain you for seven days of a difficult life like that? When I was praying for you before this service, I just got a sense God is so aware of the difficulties you face. I have spoken generally. God knows your individual challenge, and he is crying out to you. You just want me to remove it, but will you let me love you in the face of your temptations? Will you let me love you in the face of your loneliness? Will you let me love you in the face of your pain? Will you receive from my love every day? I've got so much to pour into you. i got so much to give you. And you just keep locking the door. Will you open it up? Will you let me love you? Don't be a Lucy, the white albino demon dog. Be a Maggie, the lovable, fat little beagle who just wants to follow and receive and be loved on. Let God invite you into his home. Let God invite you into his arms. Let God love you.